evening's talk is, um, has everyone ever dr driven a Rolls Royce? Has anybody owned a Rolls Royce? No? Loads of people. Yeah. Actually, there was a sister in the Lord up in Elizabeth that used to go to work in her Rolls Royce and she worked at uh, GMH and the administration of GMH told her that she can't drive that Rolls Royce to work anymore because it upset everybody, you know, who just drove smacked out Commodores and that, but yeah, so, but um, the current price of a, a Rolls Royce, um, if you're looking for a Rolls Royce, there's one advertised, 2021, it's called a Rolls Royce Ghost, and for you, it's $826,888. So I thought you'd like to know that. Just, um, But I'm sure Pastor John will buy Ray, Ray Fisher a Rolls-Royce ute for camp one day, but uh, they were reputed as being the best vehicle on earth, you know. Um, and um, I'll, go, I'll go to explain the story in a minute, but um, just bear that in mind. So we'll start off in, um, in uh, 1 Samuel chap chapter 14. Uh, just in verse, 1 Samuel 14, verse 1. So, so it, it talks about Jonathan, he's an armour bearer. You've probably heard this sort of story a thousand times, but nevertheless. Um, so, so I've just taken on an apprentice, so um, it's sort of relevant to me. Um, he's, he's my little armour bearer. He carries my tool bag, you know. So um, it's really quite interesting because a 16-year-old's perspective of life is totally different from a 70-year-old, you know, and... They see things that, well, I just, I just don't see them anymore, you know. But um, it's, it's really good. It's just so, I'm so impressed. Um, and uh, there's a huge, huge generation gap. And um, I'm afraid I just, I miss it completely, you know. And there's heaps of trouble out in the world. There's a lot more trouble than what's first or what's uh, perceived by the government. Um, there's a lot of anxiety out there here and it's, it's affecting our children, it's affecting our youth and I get direct feedback now, the stuff that's going out there is horrible. Uh, so it's horrible compared to when I was 16 or 17. It's unimaginable, you know, what these kids have to go through um, and it's affecting their lives. So I just thought we'd sp speak on this armour bearer role. Um, um, so my apprentice is my little armour bearer and uh, it says now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armour come and let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side but he told not his father and it says how Saul tarried at the uh, uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree and there was about 600 people with him, and um, I just might just just briefly go through this uh, story, verse six. Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor. Um, so an armor bearer, the definition of an armor bearer, if you just uh, hold on to verse six, he was selected by kings and, and generals because of his bravery. Uh, it's, it goes on to say not only to bear their armour but also to stand by them in a time of danger. So <clears throat> that's what my apprentice is there for, to look after me, you know, to see I don't fall off roofs and what have you. And um, they were the uh, uh, adjutants, I think that's how you pronounce it, of our modern armies. The, the adjutant bird that's the, uh, from the Stork family was so named by the British colonial troops because they had an uh, ability to stand motionless for long periods of time. So the uh, armour bearer was someone that really stuck to his job. He was always there, always reliable. He had something within him, and he was he was brave. He uh, and and his um, his boss could rely on him, you know. And uh, you know, it's it's, um, it's 
it's something very special, I believe. Um, and um, if you have someone alongside you, um, you don't always agree, perhaps, because they might be a lot younger than you, but at the same time, they have this quality of um, trust, um, of regard, of respect, and um, it goes a long way. So then you drop your guard and you teach these, these young ones and, and in like manner. So it becomes, it becomes a, more of a partnership. So I'd imagine Jonathan here was very close to this young man that bare his armour. So just continuing in, in, in six, uh, and Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armour, come and let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armour bearer said unto him, do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I'm with thee according to thy heart. So, so I haven't taken on a young apprentice, I thought, actually I've got to pay him now. <laughs> and um, it's a bit difficult because, uh, you know, we've been going through a transition coming up here and trying to run a business and what have you and COVID and all that. You still got to pay them, you know, they, they get paid holidays, they get paid all sorts, and uh, even when they don't work. So, and, um, but, but by doing such a thing, uh, and I suppose I'm, I'm talking about looking after our youth, I'm talking about caring for them and trying to understand uh, where they're coming from and what they have to go through, and, um, and their attitudes uh, towards older people, um, and that. And um, I just thought here that we've got two people running for the, for the same cause and um, it's, it's, really, um, it's really quite unique where if you've got something common, so we all have something common, we have the Lord and we have this incredible um, commitment to the Lord to do his work. So if we can incorporate our youth um, if we can get our youth to perhaps trust us and understand that we want to help them in their lives to achieve, then um, there's this incredible potential, I believe, in this church um, here today. And uh, it's always difficult as a parent because a lot of the children don't always want to communicate with their parents, but they may communicate with somebody else. And... Uh, um, just to, to get that direction. So we have to be open to it and, um, and, and sometimes we get it totally wrong too. Well, I do. Um, so we go on to the story here. Um, so they both go into battle. Um, pick it up again in um, verse 13. Verse 13. And Jonathan climbed up upon his uh, hands and upon his feet and the, his armour-bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armour-bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armour-bearer made was about 20 men, within, as it were, half an acre of land, which, is a, yoke of, which a yoke of oxen might plough. And there was a trembling in the host, in the field, and amongst the people, the garrison, and the spoilers, they also trembled, and the earth quaked, so it was um, a very great trembling. And the watchman of Saul, in verse 16, in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went on beating down one another. And then said Saul unto the people that were with him, let's have a meeting. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, but um, we, we just got some action that's just taken place. And all of, a soul, all, the, all of a sudden, Saul's trying to pull in the reins. So the glory of God is in action. And Saul says, let's have a meeting. Number now and see who has gone from us. So they're trying to, trying to control the whole thing. And it was just totally out of control. Um, the Lord had gone in to battle for Jonathan and his armor bearer as they, as they went out in faith. And, uh, and, and so it was there. So... It's just a, a, a short story, perhaps, of um, this, this, this role of the armour bearer and what it meant to Jonathan and what it means to you and I. You know, our youth 
in this assembly is so vital for the future of the church. So we, besides walking and serving the Lord ourselves continually, then we have to make way for our young ones. It's, it's, it's a must. So, so I found a little story about um, Rolls-Royce, the motor car, and how it all started. Um, so there was a guy in 1910, I'll just look at my notes here, um, um, somewhere, oh here it is, uh, Frederick Henry Royce was born in 1863, um, he was from Al Walton in England, I think that's where he was from. He was the youngest of five children and the family lived mainly in poverty uh, due to the family business going uh, bankrupt. So I think his father was into flour mills and what have you. And uh, from there the family moved to London and Henry got his first job as a bird scarer. So pigeons and uh, his pay was sixpence a week. In 1872 disaster struck and as a nine-year-old, his father died, and so Henry worked delivering newspapers and uh, telegrams. As a 15-year-old, Henry had only completed one year at school, so he was really right behind the eight ball. He says, then he began an apprenticeship, but was forced to quit and moved to Leeds and, and worked at a tool-making company, and then for the electric and power company in London, and they then they had to move to Elizabeth, uh, to Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, you mess me up now. And, uh, they had to move to uh, Liverpool. Um, he, he, his true ambition was to, to make engine, engineering his full-time profession. So he had no qualifications, no schooling. And so as a 22-year-old, he, he started a business with a fellow engineer, Ernest Claremont, and they formed this company, F.H. Royce and Co., and manufactured electrical components. And by 1894, they made started making electric cranes. So he's a pretty smart cookie, although he had no formal education. So in 1901, Henry became interested in motor cars, and by 1903, he built and designed his own uh, two-cylinder petrol motor car. He built three of these cars. One he kept, one he gave to the other business partner, um, Ernest Claremont, and to the other, Henry um, um, gave to a, a, a shareholder, um, a guy called Henry Edmonds, who would eventually set up a meeting between Henry Royce and a young man called Charles Rolls. So that's how they formed Rolls-Royce. So Charles Rolls was a young guy. He was an entrepreneur. He was born, you know, with his, uh, you know, fed with a silver spoon and all that sort of thing. He had a tremendous education in, in uh, um, Cambridge um, in, in, uh, in UK. I think he went to a, a Trinity College in Cambridge. Um, he was a 26-year-old entrepreneur. He loved racing cars, he loved flying. He was one of those guys who um, I would imagine my generation would have totally rejected. You know, we, we were born into hard work, six days a week, and no pleasure. Our pleasure was work, and that's all. It's still the same, as it turns out. And uh, the only pleasure I have is a latte and uh, a pie with sauce, and say, just keep working, you know, it's just the way it is. But you, you could imagine the conflict you know, one was highly educated, well-versed, um, of, a, of a noble sort of um, um, position in life, and the other chap was a guy on the tools, no education, but he was just a fabulous um, self-made uh, engineer. So, so we had... Um, so Charles Rolls, um, he was born um, to Lord and Lady... Um, Lang Langatok, I think it's who they were. Um, so he he decided he he was going to 
um, sell cars, import cars into England. And uh, with the financial support of his father, he opened a successful car dealership in Great Britain in 1903. And he named the company C.S. Rolls & Co. So the combination of these two characters is what we know today as Rolls-Royce. They've been now, you know, I think bought out by BMW. But you, you, when you start mentioning Rolls-Royce, you're talking about the best of the best. And, um, and to own such a car would have been awesome, you know. But you, you're talking about two men who, who was this incredible, unusual duo. One was, uh, I think... Uh, Royce was 41, and, and I think Rolls was a 26-year-old daredevil, you know? He was into to everything. So, you know, that's just to give you an, an idea of what, what went on. My notes are upside down. Um, so, so, just to sort of finish off the story here, so in... 1910, uh, Charles Royce, the young entrepreneur, he became the first person to make a non-stop double flight across the English Channel on one of those biplanes. And one month later, he died in a plane crash at the age of 32 years. So it was a short life, but uh, Henry, the old guy, um, he lived until he was 70. Uh, but together, they established... Uh, probably the most famous motor company in the world. They ended up um, having um, 130 dealerships spread over 40 countries. So um, this is a story about a young guy and an old guy. And, and combined, they, they just, you know, they, 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 they've got this legacy which still continues today. And uh, just liking it to the church, it can actually happen here too. As if we, if we promote one another's qualities and not one another's mistakes or failings, you know. It's easy, so easy to criticise and, um, and it's so difficult to understand one another. But so the Lord reads the heart of men, of all men. He knows what's in your heart. And, and we all have a desire, otherwise we wouldn't be here. We have a desire, all of us, to serve the Lord or to be with the Lord. So it's a fabulous start to, a, to, to, to make an incredible combination for the continuance of this fellowship. You know, and you think, oh, it's going pretty cool, you know, Woodcroft's good. But we've seen it all over the years. People come and people go, churches raise and churches fall, you know, businesses, huge businesses overnight go bankrupt. And you think, oh, it would never happen. But we've got to make sure it never happens to this church, that we continue and teach our children well. So um, just something that um, Henry Royce said, he said, strive for perfection in everything you do. Take the best that exists and, and make it better. And when it does not exist, design it or redesign it. You know, it's a real challenge actually, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, we can do better. That's what I'm saying, without striving, without putting anybody under pressure. We can do better in our relationship with the Lord and in our relationship with one with the other. You know, because, because you know, it's our profession. You know, it's who we really are. And, and you get someone comes in and all they do is talk about the Lord and you think... Gee, I wish I could do that, you know, I'm consumed by business and consumed by the affairs of the church and all this sort of stuff and you sometimes think, I just want to talk about the Lord and uh, it's good to be like that, it's, uh, it's good to be inspired, so don't ever stop talking about the Lord. So that was just um, something that worked for Rolls-Royce, you know, a young guy and an old guy, it's a great story. Um, there was another story I was looking at, um, Pelé, you know, the soccer player for Brazil, you who play soccer. And Tony Stevens, I know Tony plays soccer and all that. But um, he was a young kid, you know, he never had, a, never had any shoes, never had any soccer boots. And they were just unbelievable little soccer players and they were underprivileged and he just talked about his rise to fame, you know. And uh, sometimes people say, you know, well, 
I know I've got to say something about the Church of Prosperity or some of these Thursday, but I just thought these kids, when they started and had nothing, that's when they were really famous. You know, when they had nothing. And, and you and I, you know, when you first come to the Lord, it's just like this incredible experience and everything else in our lives pales to insignificance and you, you find yourself in this position where now all things are possible. But money and riches are always going to destroy that. You'll never achieve uh, real success when, when all you're worried about is how much money you've got in the bank. So, you know, you've come to the wrong place if you're looking to get rich. You know, and um, it's important that, you know, some of these examples in life, uh, this Pelé, he was, uh, I think they played... Uh, uh, Tony, I need some help here. Is it Sweden or Finland or Denmark in the World Cup? Did anyone know? Nobody knows. No? Denmark? I thought he was a boxer. <laughs> uh, he plays soccer too. A dangerous centre forward. Fast chat. Yeah. Um, but I know they were, I know they were down one nil, and, and the, the Danes were pretty big breed and, and the Brazilians are very small in, in comparison and they got a goal and, and Pelé just decided he was just going to play his natural game and he responded immediately with, uh, with a goal for Brazil and I think they ended up winning 5-2 you know and uh, it was like the, they performed the impossible and they went from rags to riches. I know he bought his parents a, a radio and all that so they could all tune in and you know, sort of go along with the, the glory sort of thing. But um, it's, it all starts off, it all starts off when we're young in the Lord. Whether you come to the age of, uh, come to the Lord at, at 14 or 80, it doesn't matter. But sometimes it doesn't take much to put us down and we give up before we even start. And in every situation where kids, you know, just need that little bit of encouragement from you and I. You know, I just need, come on, you know, this, we can do this together. Because it's your church, you know. If, you, if you're a, a young person and um, you just want, you just, something's burning within your soul, you know, God knows and God can use that. But don't let anybody um, put you down, you know. It's, don't let anyone put you off. Because we've seen it all as we get older. People come and go and uh, we've seen the best and, um, and the Lord's chosen you. The Lord's chosen you now to serve him. He's put his Holy Ghost within you and you can, well, they say, you can really do something, some good damage for the Lord, you know, and uh, don't limit yourself by your own self-condemnation. So, um, so another little story. I think I finished that one. Yeah. Um, okay, so Luke 2. How, how long have I got? It says 23 minutes. Is that it or...? No one's saying anything. Doesn't matter. Okay, we'll go on for a bit longer. Luke 2, 42. So it says, and, and when he, Jesus, was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew it not. But they supposing him to have been in the company went a day's journey and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance and when they found him not they turned back again to Jerusalem and you can imagine how upset Mary might have been stressed out couldn't find their lad and it came and it came to pass after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors both hearing them and asking them questions and all that heard him or Jesus were astonished at his understanding and answers. And, uh, and mum and dad just couldn't work it out. You know, they, they didn't understand who their son was particularly. And um, it says how that Mary listened to Jesus. She, she said he, she took it to heart or she kept the sayings, his sayings in, in, um, in her heart. But... The big challenge is, is trying to understand our, our children. And you see, Jesus, at that tender age, um, he was already about his father's business. 
you know, and, and you think, 12 years old. You know, that's just like, what would a 12-year-old know? And uh, we see them in the meetings and scribbling in and, and things like that. But uh, we see here potential or a possibility that a 12-year-old can do great things. And, and we've got to support that. We've got to encourage that and provoke that and um, not limit our children. And, 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 and by that, we're not limiting our own understanding and ability to, 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 to teach. You know, it's been, a, it's been a real learning thing for me to have to stop work and teach the apprentice. You know, and lend my tools, my tools, you know. My tools go back in that spot, you know. As a tradie, you've got to go fast, so you should be able to close your eyes and know exactly where your tools are. And I say, where's my tools? And he's, he's got them all over the place, you know. But, um, but we've we got to make time to teach. And I'm no teacher, you know, and, uh, but yeah, the time has come. <laughs> so, um, but um, anyhow, we, we, were up, we were up at camp the other day, and he goes, pop, eagles. And there's these, I was asking Ray, there's a, there's a couple of eagles at camp, and they just coming in. I'm sure they're homing in on the top of my head. I reckon it's a solar system or something. But um, they're really coming in close, and I said, hey, they're checking you out, Carver, because um, uh, they're quite an amazing thing. But just the, I guess we take these things for granted, but a, but a youth or a young one, they're just taken, you know? It's just like, oh, what is that, you know? And uh, it's so refreshing to be reminded of, of just the simple things, the God's creation, you know? Just to be amongst it all down at camp and... What a place. You know, we've got something special coming up you know, under the stars. Yeah, Pastor Chris is going to sing, you know. <laughs> but um, what a time, you know. It's, it's local news. Yeah, everyone's going to go down Karakalinga and, and we got our camp just there. What are you going to do? Oh, just another zone camp. Oh, I'll just go down for a feed. And No, we're going to get into the locals. We're going to invite them to our camp. We're going to expose these people to the heavens, you know, the Bible, you know, and teach them, you know, teach them because they don't know, they don't understand. They don't understand, they don't even know it's on. So we know more than what they do, you know, and uh, anyhow, that's coming up. Pastor Chris will let you know what's going on. Um, but, but, but anyhow, it's just one, one story to finish on. Am, am I done? No, a couple more minutes. 1 Samuel 16. I think it's in verse 11. So the Lord, the Lord was picking out um, the sons of Jesse or um, to anoint one of them. And again... David's father got it totally wrong. And um, so he brings forth all his sons to present them before Samuel. And he said, no, nah, this, this is not who the Lord has chosen. And just prior to this, the Lord says, I'll just get it for you. Um, in verse 7, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. So even, even David's father got it totally wrong, and David's brothers down the track. And um, it goes on to say in verse 12, or just continuing, sorry, in verse 11, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and, and brought him in, and he was, he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. Um, and he was anointed by Samuel. And, um, and then it goes on to say how that Saul then makes David his armour bearer. So you read the story, and then from there... He goes out and fights Goliath as a, a, perhaps a very young lad. But he'd already been proved by the Lord. And that's not something that um, 
was not taken into consideration by Jesse or by his brothers, you know, and, um, and also, of course, Goliath. You know, Goliath was sort of threatening Israel. But um, this lad had been already proved. And um, sometimes that we, we miss the point. You know, sometimes people are all ready to go and they're sitting right down at our feet. So what we've got to do is change our thinking a little and pray for our children and pray for our youth. That, um, you know, when, when this was a story where he's, uh, one of the prophets says, Lord, open his eyes, give him the same vision. I think that's what we've got to do with our kids is that they need their eyes opened so they can continue this good work and, and all the people said, Amen. Hand over to Peter.